Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is always a privilege to share the word of the Lord. Truly, I think this might be a little high here. And uh, before we get into our message this morning, as it is my tradition, I want to invite you to do two things with me. Number one, please pray for yourself. Because I desire for the Spirit of God to be the one to communicate the message to you this morning and not myself. We've come to hear a word from the Lord, amen? amen. If ever we needed to hear a word from the Lord, it's now. And please pray for myself because I realize my weakness and my need to be used by God's hand. So please pray that the Lord will speak to me as I seek to be used to speak to you, amen? So at this time, I'm going to kneel and pray, and if you're so inclined to do so, I invite you to kneel with me as well as we go before the throne of God. Father in heaven, great God of the universe, we humbly kneel in your presence, and we thank you for your great love for us. And because we know that you love us, Lord, we claim your promises in faith, nothing wavering. For you said, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that you are the rewarder of them that diligently seek you. Father, we seek your face this morning, first off, for a cleansing of our sin. That our hearts will be wiped clean, covered in the blood of Christ Jesus. And that you would add unto us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. For you promised us, if your parents being evil know how to give good gifts unto their children, how much more would your Father which is in heaven give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask him? And Lord, we need thy Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. So inhabit us, Lord. Send your holy angels that wax valiant in battle to be here in your sanctuary that any demonic agencies that might be in your courts might be restrained and pushed back. And then I claim your promise in Jeremiah 33 and 3, my favorite promise, Lord. You said, call upon me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Lord, I admit my ignorance. I admit that I have no good thing in me but I trust in you, and I pray that you would impart unto me your divine knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom you have sent in your name, will bring back to my remembrance all those things which you have taught me. For these things I pray and ask in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now I have something I'd like to read to you. This might be very difficult, how I'm positioned here. But nonetheless, we'll do that. Do you mind if I step down for a moment? Thank you. This is the book Evangelism, page 705. As we near the close of time, there will be greater and still greater external parade of heathen power of heathen deities, or rather heathen deities, will manifest their signal power. We're talking about heathen deities. Is Buddha a heathen deity? What about Krishna, or Vishnu, or Mary? Would you say that all of these would be heathen deities? Well, we're told as we near the closing of time that we will see a greater external parade of heathen power and they will exhibit themselves before the cities of the world. And this delineation has already begun to be fulfilled. Pay close attention to the screen. This is video footage that was taken in Africa just uh, earlier this year. Close you right in here. You see anything interesting? As you can see, this happened in broad daylight. There were several natives of this village that were amazed to see what appeared to be an apparition of Mary in the sun. 
This is not computer generated images that you're looking at here. Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. Let's go forward. Do I have sound? Thank you. Let's go back. Let's go back. There we go. <laughs> A UFO hovers over one of the holiest sites in Islam, the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, the spot where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven, built on top of a site sacred to Judaism. An American woman takes it all in her stride, seen it all before. We had, we've seen them in Mississippi like this, but never like, never like this. <laughs> Easily dismissed as a hoax until you see this. The same event, or so it seems, filmed from a different angle by someone else. The glowing ball of light dropping until it hangs just over the dome of the rock. These spectators a little more impressed. Whoa! <laughs> and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed. The ball into suddenly an shooting angel off as if of light many of you have been waiting for strange and mysterious lights hovering above east el paso tonight what's even more strange very similar lights were spotted in manhattan just two days ago above the skies of northeast and east el paso tonight a sight that was a little more than stunning this is what one of our photographers ram moreno caught on video one solitary light that appears to be falling in the sky. But that light suddenly breaks apart into two, then three separate lights. Those lights then just freeze in the air and begin to hover. Eventually, a fourth light can be seen. Then the lights appear to be hovering and then moving in a strange pattern. Then they all disappear. We received a lot of phone calls into our newsroom tonight from people in the northeast part of town and on the east side all of them wanting to know what was going on. And the descriptions from everyone calling, basically the same. One caller thought a plane was falling. Another thought it was a meteorite. Others, though, said it looked like a UFO. Now, you want to get really creepy? Check this video out. Just two days ago, in the sky above Manhattan, people froze on the street there as they saw these three lights hovering in the middle of the day. And check this out. The three lights are close to each other, then spread out into this triangle pattern. Now, look at the pattern side by side. This from Manhattan and the other tonight in El Paso. I gotta tell you, they do look eerily similar. Well, tonight we did no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Una conversación con Luis Farrakhan, un hombre que encabezó una marcha de un millón de hombres en Washington, un hombre que es reconocido de alguna manera como el sucesor de los líderes negros más importantes que existen o han existido en los Estados Unidos. Este hombre, para nuestra sorpresa, habla abiertamente del fenómeno extraterrestre. Nos dice no solamente que es una verdad, sino que es inevitable y que el mundo muy pronto conocerá de esta extraordinaria realidad. It has been a secret, uh, above top secret, in the United States and in governments around the world. But more recently, governments have decided to expose to their populace the reality of the existence of these so-called unidentified flying objects. Do you think it's time now to let everybody know about this? Are we ready for this? Whether those in power think it's time or not is immaterial or irrelevant because these wheels are now being seen 
over the major cities and when human beings of intelligence can look up and see these phenomena or this phenomena how can you keep hiding it in the midst of thousands upon thousands of people now seeing them and in this modern age of technology with um, recording instruments in a telephone that is now in the hands of millions and billions of people then when they show up the people film it so now what can you say now you could say it was swamp gas yesterday you could say it was a balloon you could say it was all these uh, explain away techniques of masterful liars and artful deceivers but today it is time and now it is being made manifest so somebody has to answer the question what are they why are they there why have they been over all of the atomic installations not only in america but all over the world why please read the captions on this one Некоторые в Тбилиси считают, что Москва словами Геннадия Онищенко о допуске грузинских вин на российский рынок выкидывает белый флаг перед Грузией, от которой зависит вступление России во Всемирную торговую организацию. Что было сказали по этому поводу? Никакого белого флага нету, не надейтесь, ни перед кем никогда мы не склоняли голову. Перед нами склоняли голову все великие державы. И Китай, и Япония, Германия, Франция, и том, в том числе и США. А допуск ВИН, я думаю, что здесь проблема в целом общая. Мы прекращали допуск на наш рынок любых товаров из Молдавии, и из Белоруссии, поэтому прямой связи да, но Владимир с Вольфович. отношением Грузии и вступлением России в ВТО и проблемами, связанными с каким-то экспортом в Россию, я думаю, нет. Рычагов достаточно у России, чтобы повлиять на Грузию и получить... От нее нужное для России решение. С винами, без вин, с таможней, без таможни. Решение будет найдено. Об этом договорятся в Вашингтоне и в Москве. В Брюсселе и в Китае, в Пекине. Только четыре столицы в мире. Вашингтон, Брюссель, Москва, Пекин. Все, четыре столицы. Больше никто ни на что влиять не может. И лишний игрок в международных отношениях. Четыре столицы всегда договорятся. Обама, представитель Евросоюза, Медведев, представитель Китая. Все, они вчетвером договорятся. При этом китайцы приедут в Москву, согласятся с позицией Москвы. Европейцы приедут в Москву, согласятся с позицией Москвы. И американцы приедут в Москву, как Байден сейчас был. И обо всем договорятся. Проблем нет. Все решают только четыре столицы. При этом Вашингтон не имеет будущего, Америка искусственное государство рухнет, Европа старая, так сказать, уже континент, который никакой роли не играет, Китай на пороге взрыва. И остается космическая держава Россия с огромными деньгами, ресурсами и новым оружием, о котором еще никто не знает. Любую часть планеты уничтожим в течение 15 минут. Ни одного взрыва, ни одного, так сказать, всплеска там, луча какого-то лазерного, mm -hmm. там, молния. Нет, тихо, спокойненько. Целые континенты будут спать вечным сном. А может вы нам И подробнее останется, расскажете, как вы собираетесь это легкой, делать? Все остальное. Вот цунами сейчас, Япония. Вы курилы хотели? Вот вы будете разбирать обломки всех ваших зданий. И сдохните все 120 миллионов, если вы еще потребуете курила от нас. Так и все остальные. Пусть подумают о своем будущем. О своем будущем пусть думают. Тоже мне еще грузинские вина и там какие-то наблюдатели. Они хотят, чтобы забыли слово Грузия в мире. И будет русско-турецкая граница. Вот подумайте, пускай Сакашвили об этом. То цунами будет другое. В другой части Кавказа. Do you think it's possible that men might possess the technology to be able to manipulate the elements? Well, from what this gentleman just said, they do. This is not just some 
run-of-the-mill Joe that made this statement, by the way. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Please open your Bibles with me. The book of Matthew, chapter 24, and verse 4. Matthew, chapter 24, and verse 4. When Jesus spoke with his disciples in relationship to his second coming and the signs foretelling the end of the world, the very first statement that Jesus made was, Take heed that no man deceive you. We are living in a time of immense deception. We're living in a time in which if we are not rooted and grounded in the truth found within the word of God, we will be removed from the faith that was delivered to the saints. It is not just maybe a possibility. It's the reality that we're facing. The Bible makes a very important statement in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28. Please turn your Bibles there with me as well now. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28. We're told in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 28, And wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That word eagles in the original Greek also means vultures. This makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the vultures be gathered together. Now, all of us that are familiar with vultures know that if you see one vulture flying around in the sky, it's not any reason for you to be uh, alarmed. But you know when you see one or two or three vultures swarming about in the air, doing a circular pattern, you know of a surety that there is a dead carcass of some creature or possibly a human being that may be nearby that they're getting ready to swoop down on and make it their prey. And Jesus Christ himself has given us this example from nature to use in our understanding of the prophetic signs that are found within the book of Matthew chapter 24. You see, if you see one nation rising up against one nation, well, this is something that's serious, but the Bible tells us in verse, I believe it is, verse, yes, verse 6, that, well, the end is not yet, is it? You may hear some rumors but the end is not yet. But if you see nations rising up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms and you see famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, all of these things happening simultaneously, then you can know of a surety that the second coming of Jesus Christ is even at the doors. Brothers and sisters, are we seeing these things happening right now? And I can imagine that there may be some amongst us that say, my brother, I, I, I've been studying the Bible for longer than you have even been in existence, possibly before your parents came into existence. And I've been hearing about the second coming of Jesus Christ from the time I was a little lad or a little girl. But the Bible gives us some very important information in the book of 2 Peter. Turn your Bibles there with me, please. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. Are you there with me? We're told in the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye already know them, and be established in the present truth. Here the Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, has told us that there is certain information that the true preacher of righteousness will continually, repetitively set before the people of God, though they are already, though they are already familiar with this information. But it is only by repeating this information over and over and over again that we as God's people can be established in the present truth. My question for you this morning is, what is the present truth? Somebody said the three angels' message. What is the present truth? 
Let me ask you another question. Do you think it's important that we know what the present truth is? So then that makes my first question valid, so I'll ask it again then. What is the present truth? Prepare to meet thy God. This morning, I'd like us to take just a few moments to see what the Bible defines truth as. And as we see what the Bible defines truth as, I pray that we will come to a better understanding of what the present truth is. Amen? Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32. Deuteronomy, chapter 32 and verse 4. We are looking to find out what does the Bible define truth as. Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, and we're going to be looking at verse 4. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter and verse 4, the Bible tells us he is the rock. His works are what? Perfect, for all his ways are what? Judging. A God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. So number one, God is truth. Turn your Bibles now with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 119. Psalm 119. And we're now going to look at verse 142. Psalm 119 and verse 142. We are seeing what the Bible defines truth as. In Psalm 119 and verse 142, the Bible tells us, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Now drop down further in that same chapter to Psalm 119 and verse 151. Psalm 119 and verse 151. You're in the same place now. We're just dropping down a few scriptures. We are told here, thou art, or, thou art near, O Lord, and all thy what? Commandments are truth. So God is truth, the law is truth, and obviously the commandments are truth as well. Now let's go over to the book of John. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you already know them, and be established in the present truth. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the... We should all be saying this together. Are, are you excited about the word of God? <laughs> I'm excited about the word of God. The Bible tells us in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's very important because it's truth. Now let's go over to the book of John chapter 16 and verse 13, or rather the chapter, John 16 and verse 13. We're still looking at what the Bible defines as truth. John 16 and verse 13. The Bible tells us here, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Spirit of God is truth. And now our final scripture in John 17 and 17. I pray that we can all quote this one without even looking at the scripture. In John 17 and verse 17, Bible tells us, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Truth. So the Bible has told us that God is truth, the law is truth, the commandments are truth, Jesus is truth, the Holy Spirit is truth, and the Word of God, which was inspired by the Spirit of truth, is also truth. All of these comprise absolute truth. And by the way, Christians are the only people in this world that believe that there is an absolute truth. We are the only people in this world that know absolute truth. We are blessed. So we know what the Bible defines truth as, but the first question still stands to be answered. What is present truth? Turn your Bibles with me now to the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Revelation, the 14th chapter, and we're going to begin at verse 1. Brothers and sisters, it is absolutely important that we know what the present truth is. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, 
And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with them a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their what? Foreheads. Yes. Now, the Bible tells us that when John looked, he saw a lamb standing on the Mount Zion with a hundred and forty and four thousand. Who was this lamb standing on the Mount Zion? You say, Jesus. I say, Give me a Bible scripture. See, part of, part of my agenda is not just to prophesy the word of God, but to help to establish God's people in his truth. We are told that God's people need more teaching than we need preaching because we're coming upon a time when we have to give an answer for the reason of the faith that is within us. And we can say anything off the top of our head, but can we prove that which we believe so that some other can be established in the truth that Christ Jesus has guided us into? Turn your Bibles with me to John chapter 1 and verse 29. John 1 and verse 29. The Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 29, And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the what? world. So the Lamb of God is a symbol of Jesus Christ. When we see this Lamb standing on the Mount Zion with 140 and 4,000, we are seeing Jesus Christ symbolized as the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for humanity. And those that stand with him have availed themselves of the cleansing blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is why they stand with the Lamb. That lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? But we also learn in John 14 and verse 6 that that same Jesus Christ said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if the lamb is synonymous with Jesus Christ, and truth is synonymous with Jesus Christ, then the lamb and the truth are one and the same as well. Are you following me now? So standing on that Mount Zion is truth. Are you with me? What's my point? Look what the Bible goes on to say in Revelation chapter 14. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of what? A great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from among men. Now pay close attention to the very next verse. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb. These are they which follow Jesus. These are they which follow the truth whithersoever the truth goeth. Are you following me now? Wherever the Lamb of God is, Jesus Christ is present truth. And there will always be a people that will be following the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of this world. It is only as we follow the present truth that we stay in step with Jesus Christ in this work that he is engaged in to cleanse us from all of our sins. So my next question is, where is Jesus? Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 34. Brethren, I came not here this morning to share with you any new mysterious doctrine. My desire is that we be established in the present truth. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that has died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Presently, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God, and he is making intercession for all of humanity. 
Look what else the Bible tells us about Christ's position at the right hand of God in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Hebrews, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 1. The Bible tells us here, now of all the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, which is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the tabernacle, and of the true, what? A minister of the sanctuary, rather, isn't that right? That's why you have to call me on the scripture, brother, I love that. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. So Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the throne of the majesty located in heaven, and he is officiating as our high priest. He is interceding for us. And if Jesus is interceding, this must mean that there is a case that is pending at the bar of judgment, because no man needs an intercessor without a court case. What does the Bible say about this in the book of Daniel? Turn your Bibles there with me. Daniel, the seventh chapter. Daniel chapter 7, we'll begin at verse 9. Let us be established in this present truth. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel, the 7th chapter and verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, or cast down means the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head as the pure wool. His throne was as the fiery flame, and his wills as the burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. This is the present truth. The present truth is this, brothers and sisters. Currently, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the throne of God, officiating as our high priest. And the characters of all of those who professed and profess to have received the blood of Christ that they might pass from death into life, our characters are being examined against the great standard of universal truth, the Ten Commandments. And in this work, God has sent forth his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, that if we would yield our hearts to his influence, he will guide us into all truth. He will guide us into how we can reveal the depth the breadth and the height of the love of God as revealed in Jesus Christ, who is the very embodiment of the truth himself. God is looking for people that will reflect the character of Jesus Christ. For he is a God of truth without iniquity. Just and right is he. My question to you this morning is, how are you fearing in the judgment? Are you established in this present truth? Are you following the Lamb of God? Are you experiencing on a daily basis a greater experience with Christ Jesus than the day before? Because as you follow the Lamb, we should be experiencing more and more and more victory over the hereditary and cultivated sins in our lives until one day we shall be perfect. Did you hear the word I used? We shall be perfect, complete in our character development because it will be Christ in us, the hope of glory. How are you fearing in this present truth? These hours of probation are precious. Every moment that God gives us the opportunity to breathe and to accept his divine nature, every moment is of immense consequence. We cannot continue to push aside the grace of God or to treat it as if it was some common thing. God 
God is the God of the universe, the almighty God who sits upon a throne terrible. Brothers and sisters, we need to consider what is our walk like with Jesus Christ right now? Are you surrendering your heart so that he can give you the ability to gain victory over having arguments with your husband or your wife? Are you asking him to give you the victory over your appetites and your passions, which are clamoring for the mastery over you? Are you asking him to help you to love that person that clearly has it out for you for no reason? Are you willing to give and to do everything for the glory of God? If any man will come after him, let him deny himself pick up his cross, and follow him. How are you fearing in the judgment? These hours of probation won't continue forever. The Bible lets us know clearly that very shortly from now, there is going to be a rapid shift, or rather, a drastic shift in the courts of God. We are told in the book of Revelation, chapter 15 and verse 7, Revelation chapter 15 and verse 7. And I saw one of the four beasts give unto the seven angels seven golden vials filled with the wrath of God, which liveth forever and ever. And the temple of God was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Very shortly from this time that we are discussing this issue, the temple of God shall be filled with smoke. And the Bible lets us know in no uncertain terms that at that time no man shall be able to enter into the temple. And if no man will be able to enter into the temple at that time, humanity will be faced with a massive dilemma. Because we are told in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. At the time when the temple of God is filled with smoke, Jesus Christ, who stands as the representative of the human race, will remove his high priestly garments. He will step out of the presence of the Father, and he will then adorn himself with the robes of vengeance. And then the saying of Revelation chapter 22 and 11 shall come to pass. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to as his works shall be. For faith without works is dead. It's coming. Are we preparing? The hand of God is stretched out to save us, brothers and sisters. Beloved, the Lord desires to cleanse us from all of our sins. We are told in 1 John 1 and 9, these are familiar scriptures I'm sharing with you this morning. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to do what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you willing to confess your sin? Are you willing to spend time on your knees weeping and pleading with the Lord to renew your heart in the power of his spirit? to give you a new experience, to make you into a man or a woman that will exalt his character in a time when all the world 
will be united in making void the law of God. You saw last night, that time is right upon us. Without a shadow of a doubt, we are a part of the final generation. The signs are clear. And we would be hypocrites in the eyesight of Jesus Christ himself if we denied that these signs that are right now transpiring within our world are not the very signs that foreshadow the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are you going to accept the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from your sins? This is the choice we need to make. And we need to make this choice today. In closing, I'd like to take us to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation, the third chapter. And verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus desires to have entrance into your heart. Will you let him in? To have full control over your life. Every desire, every word, every action, everything yielded to the one that loves us best. He's trying to save us so that he can use us to finish the work of proclaiming this everlasting gospel. It's time for us to step out of our comfort zones and to finish the work, to finish the work that he is so, he's been so kind to commit into the hands of foolish mortals. I have a short testimony I'd like to share with you before I make my appeal. A few years back as I was working as a call porter, and I tried to continue to work knocking on doors and going out into the streets because it's just not enough to do this thing in the pulpit. There's so many people that need this message. Jesus Christ would never confine his work to a pulpit. I remember as I was going out knocking on doors, I realized after a time that when I met somebody and they gave me a good cursing out, I was going to have a good day that day. And boy, I knocked on the door and this brother string together some curse words. After he was finished with me, I said, Lord, I'm going to be blessed today. And I continued to knock on doors and wasn't selling any books, but my agenda was always to tell people about the love of Jesus Christ and the nearness of his second coming and the necessity of being prepared. And so I just continued on my mission. And then I remember I came to one door, one door and I knocked on the door and an elderly man came to the door and he said, are you a Catholic? And I said to him, well, I, uh, I attended St. Dominic's school. <laughs> that was an academy in the area. And he laughed and I laughed and he said, well, I'm a good Catholic and I'm going to give you a donation. I never told this man what my name was and what my purpose was for being at his door. But he said he's going to give me a donation. He runs back inside, and I'm just standing there on his doorstep chuckling. And he comes back out, and he has his wallet, and he begins to thumb through his wallet. And he says, are you in school studying to be a priest or a pastor? Is it a priest? No, you're studying to be a pastor. And he says, you know something? You remind me of my pastor. And I go to prayer meetings at my church every Wednesday. I mean, this guy was going off in a tangent. And I'm just standing there laughing. And he says, you know, I... And as he goes through all of this, he just grabs and goes right in his wallet and says, you know something, take all the money. And he says, I'm going to see you in, on television. And I said, I'll see you in heaven. Little did I know, years later, somebody would ask me to be on television. Brethren, you think people are not seeking the face of the Lord? You think that God doesn't have his 10,000 that are not within these ranks at this time? Don't deceive yourself. And as I walked from that man's door, I was excited because now I've met my quota for the day. 
And so now I can really just enjoy telling everybody about Jesus. And it was a Friday, and so I had a limited amount of time because the sun was getting ready to set. And I remember I got to this final door. I said, I'm going to knock on this door, and after this, I'm going home. I need to make sure that all things are in order for the Sabbath. And so I knocked on the door, and nobody came to the door. I went from the doorstep, walked down the driveway, and then all of a sudden, I heard a voice Yes, and I turned around, and it was a middle-aged Caucasian woman. This is a very nice neighborhood I was in. And so I went back, and, and I went to the door, and I began to canvas her on uh, an encyclopedia uh, of health. And I went through this, and I was telling her about all the benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And she says, oh, I'm not interested. And I said, fine, and I began to tell her about Jesus. And Jesus loves us, and Jesus is getting ready to come back. Whatever the Spirit of God had pressed upon my heart, that is what I shared with her. And then I said, God bless you and you have a wonderful evening. And then I turned to walk down her driveway, and I started down the sidewalk, and all of a sudden, this woman screamed out to me, hey! So I kind of turned around, and she said, do you want to talk to me? I was pretty surprised that she spoke to me <laughs> with that tone, and I said, uh, yes, yes, I do. Then she sat down on her doorstep, and she patted the doorstep. She said, come here and sit down next to me. So I, I turned back up the driveway, and I went and I sat down next to her, opened my bag up once again, I took out my encyclopedia of health, and I began to canvass her on the book again. She said, no, 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 I don't want to hear about that. So I'm wondering what this woman wants to hear about. She says, what I want to know is why are you so young and you believe in Jesus? And I said, oh, you want a Bible study. And I pulled my Bible out. And I began to go through various scriptures and shared with her the love of God and what the Lord was doing for me in my life and why I was excited about the Lord. And then this woman said to me something that I will never forget. She looked at me with the most curious look in her eyes. She said, are you Jesus? <laughs> now, of course, I thought this lady was joking. So I said, no, ma'am, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. And I start going again. She says, are you Jesus? Now, this woman is not insane. This happens to be a very nice community that I'm in. And I'm saying, no, I'm not Jesus. She said, are, she said tell me the truth. Are you Jesus? And I said, no, ma'am, I'm not Jesus. And then she looked back. She said, I can't believe it. I never knew that Jesus was black. And then I got first, I said, listen, listen, ma'am, I'm not Jesus. And then she said to me, you must be Jesus. Because why else would a young black man be knocking on doors in an all-white community telling people about Jesus? You see, brothers and sisters, she saw Jesus because I stepped out of my comfort zone. Are you willing to step out of yours? People need to see Jesus in our lives. It's time that we wake up. The Lord has a work that he's trying to do in our hearts, and he has a work that he's trying to do through our lives. Are you going to allow people to see Jesus in you? I have an appeal I would like to make this morning, and so I ask everybody to please bow your heads and close your eyes, and please pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your brother and your sister. The Lord is here, even at the doors of our heart. My first appeal is to you, my brother, my sister. You may have been in this faith for many years, and you realize this morning, as the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, that you need to recommit yourself to his service. You need to reconsecrate your heart to following and performing the will of God in your life. And today you want to say anew, Lord, I want you to be the master of all that I think, all that I do, all that I say. I want to be used by you so that people can come to know the love of Christ while there is still an opportunity for me to be used. If that's the commitment that you want to make before God and heaven today, I invite you to stand with me as I as well make my commitment afresh with the Lord.
And then I have one last appeal. And I ask you to please continue to pray and pray for each one of us here in the midst of God's sanctuary. Because somebody might need to receive the salvation of Jesus Christ for the first time this morning. My final appeal is to you, my friend, that may have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And today you want to say, Lord, I want to be your child. I want to know what it means to serve God. I want to learn of you. I want to be taught by you. I want to be a part of your eternal kingdom. Please teach me. Please receive me. I want to surrender my all to you. If this is the decision that you desire to make this morning for the very first time, to surrender your heart to Jesus Christ, I invite you to raise your hand wherever you're at. I see your little hand. Praise God for you. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Is there another that would like to say, Lord Jesus, I'd like you to come into my heart? Then let us pray and ask God to seal up our decisions. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. It's plain, it's clear, it is simple, but it is powerful. And I pray that the power of your word will not be lost on us because we refuse to allow your spirit to abide within our hearts. This morning, we have recommitted ourselves to your service. We have taken our stand on the side of heaven and our desire is that you would take our lives and use them as instruments to lead people to Jesus Christ. Father, in these final hours of earth's probation, may we in the judgment be found hidden in the righteousness of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, so that when our characters are reviewed, you will see that the truth is hidden in our hearts. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.